So I would like to um, briefly touch upon the issue of tackling the vulnerable plaque itself. As you know, atherosclerosis is a general disease with local manifestations, but we have first and foremost to treat the vulnerable patient, let's say take care of his risk factors, and then try to target the vulnerable plaque itself, either by a systemic approach or by a local approach. Just to remind you the complexity of the onset of thrombosis at the site of a ruptured plaque, the old Virkov triad is still valid in which we have rheological factors in combination with blood composition factors and local vessel wall substrate factors. The rheology factors, uh, especially due to lesions, we have changes in uh, the shear stress, which will have uh, deleterious effects, both high st uh, shear stress and oscillatory shear stress. Of course, these elements um, can be taken care of by treating the lesion, either by PCA or by cabbage or treating vasomotion or blood pressure. On the other hand, the biological factors, metabolic, hormonal factors, coagulation, homeostasis, infectious, this we can treat with stat statins, antiplatelets, ACE inhibitors, insulin, and so on. Now what about the local vessel substrate, the plaque, the inflammation, the lipid core, the neovascularization? What can we do at the level of these substrate issues? So just to remind you that even with most optical medical therapy, an intensive lipid lowering uh, strategy achieving the, the targets set, we still find that uh, millions of sudden deaths, MI, will occur presumably due to acute coronary occlusion at the site of a so-called vulnerable plaque. Now, what are the prerequisites for targeting the vulnerable plaque itself? Of course, we should know ideally the natural history of a vulnerable plaque. When a plaque becomes vulnerable, the critical cap thickness, the core volume mechanism leading to plaque disruption, speed of core volume enlargement, all those issues are today unknown. Um, we also, if we want to treat the vulnerable plaque, we have to be able to identify all the TICFA, all the uh, uh, tin cap ateromas, plaque erosion, calcified nodules, which all can produce thrombotic uh, plaques. And by modern uh, technology like IVUS, OCT, pulpography, uh, near infrared spectroscopy. Thus, all these technology are available. And the question is, can we identify those plaques today? And then there is a number, another prerequisite, of course. The number of plaques, of vulnerable plaques, should be known, and they should be limited in number. And then, of course, we will, ha we will need the proof of concept that treating vulnerable plaque locally is better than optical medical therapy. Now, uh, in a recent study, uh, regarding the frequency of um, a ruptured plaque or thin cap fibroatheroma in 50 postmortem hearts, half from cardiac deaths, half from non cardiac death, out of almost 4,000 lesions, the ruptured plaque were only 1.2% and the TICFA only 1.5%. So that means that uh, regarding the total number of plaques, those vulnerable of high vulnerable plaques are relatively limited, which is good news if you want to treat them. Where are they located? Well, in a careful uh, pathological assessment in this um, study, one has located 
tin cap and ruptured plaque uh, according to the distance from the ostium of the left main or the ostium of the uh, right coronary artery. And it's interesting that half of those vulnerable plaques were found within 22 millimeters of the ostium and 92% of those uh, um, advanced disease plaques were found within 33 millimeters of the, uh, from the ostium of the left main or the right coronary artery. So they seems to cluster in a very special proximal area, which is also good news. Then looking at the long-term outcome after stenting, looking at the difference between restenosis on the treated le le uh, lesion versus progression of atherosclerosis on the non-treated lesions, here you can see that initially the incidence is in favor for the target lesions, the events. And then we know it's restenosis, reocclusion, whatever. But then after two years follow-up, you see that the new events are most often occurring in the non-target lesion of the non-target vessel. So that means that atherosclerosis after stenting does not only affect the treated lesion or the target lesion, but also, and more often so, targets the non-treated lesions, possibly due to uh, vulnerable plaques in those untreated segments. So the PROSPECT trial was uh, set up to try to answer the, the question of the natural history of atherosclerosis, to assess if diagnostic modalities or serological markers of inflammation can predict an increased risk for future acute coronary events, and to ascertain the prevalence and the clinical significance of non-flow obstructing lesions defined as vulnerable plaques, in other words, trying to study the natural history of the non-obstructing plaques. And in this trial, um, patients uh, admitted with acute coronary events uh, were treated for the, for the index lesions, and thereafter, the other non-target vessels with minimal disease, like here in the circumflex and the RCA, were uh, truly evaluated with a number of techniques, of course, angiography, IVUS, virtual histology, and palpography depicted here in all major arteries with a clinical follow-up at one, two, three, four, and five years. So this was a major set up to try to understand the uh, natural history of non-obstructing uh, vascular disease. Now the results, quite interesting, that 20% of those patients had the cardiac event after a mean of three years. So one out of five. And in fact, those events were evenly, equally distributed between the culprit-related lesions and the non-culprit-related lesions. So it's interesting to see that new events were related equally to the treated lesion or the non-treated lesions. And if you look at the non-treated lesions, it's interesting to see that if a thin cap fibroatheroma was present, only 5% got major uh, cardiovascular adverse events, which is rather low. If you combine a thin cap with uh, the minimal luminal area, so if it's a severe lesion, then the incidence rises to 10% after three years. If you add the plaque burden as a parameter, then your incident rose a little bit more. But anyway, combining all those typical characteristics, you only end up with a risk of 18.2% after three years. So it means that um, the non-culprit 
lesion responsible for unanticipated events were angiographically mostly mild with a, a thin cap fibroatheroma that had a large plaques burden and around a small luminal area. But the specificity is, is an insufficiency to understand the progression because out of the almost 600 lesions with a thin cap, only 26 were signs of recurrent events. So this trial doesn't help us a lot to understand the natural history of atherosclerosis. Now, if we look at a, a vulnerable at a plaque in general, we can consider a vulnerable plaque a plaque with a lipid core, with a lot of vasa vasorum, as I told you yesterday, and with a thin cap, and with a pressure gradient across the lesion. What are the possible uh, targets we can focus on? It is first we can reduce let's say the inflammation within the plaque, possibly with pharmacological means. We can improve the endothelial dysfunction of this uh, plaque. We can possibly uh, seal the plaque, a uh, plaque sealing. We can possibly reduce the coagulability of the blood. We can inhibit neovascularization. I told you that plaque formation is associated with uh, neovascularization. The, the link is quite similar as with cancer. Every cancer who develops is associated with a rich angiogenesis. We can possibly reduce thrombotic potential of the plaque and we can reduce eventually the core volume. Those are theoretically a number of points we could act on, and, and then eventually also the matrix stability. I will only uh, mention three possibilities, plaque sealing, reduce the core volume, and inhibition of neovascularization. Now, plaque sealing, the rationale is that a controlled plaque rupture by balloon angioplasty will induce a moderate restenosis in most cases, thereby modulating the plaque composition by replacing the thin cap fibroatheroma by a more fibrous plaque, less prone to rupture. And by treating non-flow limiting lesions may prevent plaque rupture and will impact on subsequent incidence of MI or death. So this is the rationale arguments in favor of doing that, it's an easy job. Treating a flow-limiting plaque will alleviate symptoms, but treating non-flow-limiting plaques may impact on the incidence on the prognosis of the patients. So these are the arguments in favor. The arguments against, there is no sound experiment background for doing that. We all know that not all plaque rupture lead to coronary events. There is lack of diagnostic methods to differentiate low-grade stable vulnerable plaques. And retrospective comparison between balloon angioplasty and stenting in quite in 4,000 patients with one vessel disease showed no difference in the one-year event rate. And then the defer and the FAME trial have clearly demonstrated that not non-critical lesions may easily be deferred in time without uh, risk. And then the high short term event rate uh, outweighs any hypothetical long term benefit. Now the secret trial was set up to try to answer this. It was randomized. It used a special uh, catheter uh, and a special stand and to assess non-flow limiting vulnerable plaques. How did one assess those plaques? It was an optical catheter system for characterizing vulnerable plaque uh, on the Raman spectroscopy, which is a highly sensitive technique. As you can see, it has multiple electrodes and you do a slow pullback, make sure that the electrodes are touching 
the vessel wall and the recording you have is a kind of a Raman spectroscopy in which a color-coded uh, layout will tell you that blue are proteins, those uh, gray-brown is cholesterol, the yellow is triglyceride, and there are more um, future components that will be identifiable, metalloproteinases, LDL, oxidized LDL, and proteoglycans will all be identifiable with this technique. And the device, it's a very special stent, um, biocompatible with um, a very low radial stress, and it's self-expandable, and uh, the, the goal is that we don't want to induce a barrow trauma by placing this stent, but the stent would seal the vulnerable plaque and prevent from rupturing. And control angiography and IVs at six months and the clinical follow-up at five years. Now the initial results in 20 patients show some interesting thing. It appears that the thin cap fibroatheroma, so the vulnerable plaques on IVs and VH appears to co-localize with the high strain value measured on palpography, that the high strain is present in 60% of the patients with IVUS de derived TICFA, and that the thin cap less than 65 micron on OCT overlies the IVUS derived TICFA in 70% of the patients. And of course, in this small group, the shield implantation was 100% success. Now, what's interesting is that in all patients, there were no arguments for restenosis at the site of stent implantation. FFR remains above 75. The percent diameter is unchanged or decreased slightly. So there is arguments for slight positive remodeling at the site of the stenting. And the V-shield appears to induce an increase in the protective cap of about 174 microns. OCT is a very sensitive technology to quantify the uh, thickness of the cap. So far for um, plaque sealing. A few words about can we reduce core, the core volume of the plaque. Now, we all know that the uh, lipoprotein phospholipase A2 is an enzyme, uh, a circulating enzyme that's produced by inflammatory cells and that's responsible for growing of the, lip, uh, the lipid core or the necrotid core. And there are arguments to think that if we block this enzyme, one can reduce or limit progression of the uh, plaque volume. And indeed, in the EBS2 trial, uh, VH was used as a surrogate for clinical outcome, and it was shown that the blocker of the lipoprotein phospholipase A2, Darapladib, indeed uh, limited the progression of the lipid core in contrast to the patients we did not receive this blocker. So, these are first arguments that potentially one would be able to influence the volume of the plaque. But of course, these uh, results have to be confirmed in larger trials and have to be correlated then with the clinical outcome um, at follow-up. A last word about inhibition, about neovascularization. I have told you yesterday that neovascularization is an important aspect of plaque formation. And experimental trials have, no, this is still in patients. In patients, it's been shown that the number of vans of azorum is much higher in ruptured plaque compared to uh, stable plaques and even plaques with uh, thin cap ateroma. Now, in, in an experimental model of atherosclerosis, whereby rabbits were fed high cholesterol diet, uh, angiogenesis was visualized 
by using paramagnetic uh, nanoparticles loaded with, in, with uh, integrin, which we know will target or visualize neo-revascularization. And indeed, this is the aorta of the rabbits. When you fed them uh, with high cholesterol, after an amount of time, you, can, you visualize the neovascularization uh, in the two groups, the one which will be treated uh, and the, the one uh, which will not be treated. At that time, the same nanoparticles can be used to, um, to, inje to uh, locally inject a drug. In this case, it was an uh, anti-angiogenic drug um, um, and then you see that even after one week you see that the uh, visualization of neovascularization is much less than in the group which is not controlled and also on histology it is clear that this neovascularization is present um, at the site of the intimal formation due to the high cholesterol rabbit, high cholesterol fat uh, rabbits. In another trial in pigs, again with high cholesterol, you see that the structure of the microvasculature around the vessel is clearly um, affected and is increased in, uh, in a disorderly way. And when you treat those animals with statins, you see that you can reduce those abnormal neovascularization. So in summary, um, coronary risk secondary to vulnerable plaque is limited, is focal, and is concentrated in a relative circumscribed segment of the coronary tree, and this potentially accessible. Despite optimal standard medical therapy, the yearly incidence of new cor acute coronary incidence is still not negligible. The intraplaque hemorrhage is an important mechanism for plaque growth and plaque rupture. The hypothesis that targeting residual and on new developed non-flow limiting plaques may reduce the incidence of acute coronary syndromes is currently being evaluated. And the prerequisite for this type of local treatment, as mentioned, uh, will have to be met. And then local drug delivery aiming at inhibiting neovessel formation and reducing plaque composition in non-flow limiting lesions is still in an experimental phase. Thank you for your attention. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, a uh, little bit on management, a little bit on public health, and maybe if time permits, some questions. Uh, what management is, is simply getting things done. Getting things done from others, so in some sense managers get work done from the organization. Especially in large organizations, manage, formal management becomes more important. Uh, the larger the effort, the more systematic management through groups of people, infrastructure, technology, uh, to serve some objective of the organization. The objective may be to make money, to serve society or its various needs. Even religious building, a religious temple or Taj Mahal also needs substantial management skills. Now in real world, the resources are always limited, ideas are more, needs are more, so you have to find out ways by which you can manage the resources to produce your outcomes. And there the idea of innovations is very important. And if you see in hospitals and as we saw in clinical side, new inventions are happening. Innovations are of course a little bit different than inventions. They are new ways of solving some of the old problems. And hospitals and clinics, I'm sure you realize, need some kind of management. So I thought I'll talk about three or four management <coughs> concepts and see how we can use them. First is, as I said, management is things getting things done through others. So you have to communicate 
what you want to get done by others. So communication becomes very important tool of management, like stethoscope is an important tool which communicates sounds from the heart to the doctor's brain. Communication to others, what to communicate? Do people understand what you are saying? And many times it's very difficult to convey certain difficult diagnosis, prognosis, prevention, cost, risks to the patients and their relatives. The communication of quality, what you are do going to do may cost very high, but you may be very high quality. So how do you communicate your quality to the patient? How do you communicate your cost and effort and resources required? So we have to all learn to communicate that. Not only that, uh, we have to also learn to communicate with our staff. Do we order our staff? Do we request? Do we instruct? Do we threaten? Are we serious? Are we non-serious? What is the tone? What is the body language? All of that conveys besides the words which we speak. And many times we don't realize that our words are saying something and our body language may be saying something else. Thirdly, whom do you communicate? Do you communicate to your staff, patients, relatives, significant others, insurance companies, government regulators, etc. And finally, the proof of pudding in communication is seeing whether they have understood what you are trying to say. So always take feedback and see whether people have understood what that you want to communicate. The next important thing in any sort of management work is planning, scheduling and doing work. How to plan work, of course there are scientific techniques and as work becomes more complex, the chances of mistakes increase, so you have to sequence the work properly. First things which need to be done have to have priority. You have to manage cues and many of you I'm sure are struggling, saying so many patients want to see me, how do I manage priority? How do I ensure equity? Now this concept of equity is very funny. Uh, the most simple equity principle is first come, first serve, saying the patient who comes first must be seen first. But not always in medicine, emergency patients need priority, so we have to balance that. Sometimes politically important patients may get priority rather than emergency patients, so we have to learn to manage cues. We have to learn <coughs> how to prepare ourselves uh, and ensure proper workflow so that mistakes could be reduced, mishaps could be reduced, delays could be reduced. We have to convey our skill and confidence and calmness and patience to the patients. Of course many things could go wrong, we have to think of contingency plan when things go wrong and how to recover. Everything doesn't work as planned. How do we optimize work efficiency and standard operating procedures is a common way of doing that. And finally, error-free work, how do we ensure, and Japanese have worked on this and developed a concept called Pokayoke devices, which are used in many manufacturing organizations, now even McDonald's and other service organizations use things. Uh, there are equivalents of checklists and others which surgical specialists are now using to ensure that minimum mistakes happen. Uh, managing inventory and supplies and the techniques for that so that you have all the supplies required at any point in time is also equally important and there are fair number of techniques, simple and complex to do that. Of course standard operating procedure as much as you can standardize in your practice, it becomes easier for your lower level staff to manage the clinic. Uh, human resources is the key to any services and especially hospitals. Recruitment of staff, training, compensation, retention, motivation, disciplining, and finally, I think it's the work culture. In many organizations, people find excuses what cannot be done. And if you see some organizations develop this attitude that yes, we can do it. Of course it costs, many things cost more, but it's a question of attitude of being able to do things which the human resources staff below you have to develop to make the patients happy. Finally, in management, strategy, 
markets and quality are the three things which any manager has to sort of balance. You must understand what is your customer base you want to serve, poor, rich, middle class, what are the locales from where they are coming, locals, outsiders, foreigners. Uh, do you understand them? Do you understand their needs? What difficulties they are facing? Do you want to serve this market? You might, as a strategy, decide to change the market or to serve some other markets. What are the products and services you want to offer? What technology do you offer? And what price are you charging? And final proof of the pudding is, are your clients satisfied? Are they just satisfied or they are delighted? And if they are delighted, I'm sure not only they will come again, but they will bring more clients to you. To manage is not that difficult. You need three things. You need head to think. You need hands to do and demonstrate your leadership and actual work. And then you need heart to understand people's conditions and empathize with them. If you can develop three of these things, I'm sure you can become a good manager. With that, I want to move to public health. Uh, <clears throat> what is public health? Public health talks about the patients or the community which doesn't come to you. What is the load of the disease in the community? What are the people who are at risk in the community? So what is the denominator? What kind of area or market or people are you serving? What is the total need of healthcare in the community? What is the disease pattern? Of course, uh, one of my friends <coughs> who wanted to attract more audience in his conference uh, gave the name to this as obstetric extroscopy. People talk of endoscopy to see you inside the body. He said, no, I'm talking about extroscopy. How do people develop disease in the community? And how do they come to us or not come to us? So understanding that, is public health. We have to also think of how do we prevent disease. And many questions were asked about recurrence. I was listening last one year, uh, one hour, saying what kind of health advice do we give? What kind of advice do we give on lifestyle? Vaccination for children and other screening for diseases, etc., becomes part of public health. So as clinicians, you could also prevent future recurrence of disease and screen the family members to see if there are other people who are in early stage of disease because they share the same environment in which these diseases happen. Finally, as clinicians, you also have to take some public health action, especially notifying communicable diseases to local authorities, informing about water and air problems, writing to medical journals and newspapers, and talking to politicians and about health priorities. Some of you must be treating also politicians. The way Indian health system is because our politicians have not made a decision like Western countries to provide free care to everybody. We could do it at our economic stage. There is substantial discussion in national level on this to develop universal health care in future over next 20 years or so. So simple public health actions could be keeping your own data, doing some simple analysis and identifying patterns of abnormal diseases and collaborating in medical research which several of you uh, are doing. I just want to end by showing you this picture which is a map of London of 1850s developed by John Snow, who was a general practitioner and anesthesiologist of that time. He mapped the number of deaths because of uh, cholera, and this each one line is a death at this address. And there was a water pump, and just by developing this map, he developed the hypothesis that something is wrong with this water pump, which is producing some bad water leading to cholera. So what I'm trying to show is simple analysis of very basic data could discover disease patterns which could lead to major changes and improvements. And this is one general practitioner's work in one epidemic of cholera about 150 years ago. I'm sure all of you can do much better 
if you understand some of the principles of management and public health. Finally, I want to leave you with this message, uh, <coughs> uh, what is called bottom of pyramid thinking. Uh, in India, the bottom of the income pyramid, which is people with low income, are usually more than people at the top who have a lot of income. So lower the cost, the more accessible the medical services become. So the challenge is how do we lower the cost and maintain still the quality. And my sense is, given that India has produced nano and now the new RE60 is coming from Bajaj, I'm sure in same thinking we would be able to produce treatments which are at one-tenth or one-twentieth the global cost and which will serve our society in the best possible way and I'm sure all of you are contributing and will contribute it further. A lot can be done in public health through clinicians and the practice could improve if you understand simple principles of management and public health science. Thank you. So uh, I think most of uh, my talk is going to be about this chronic stable with maybe a couple of slides on decompensated uh, heart failure and a couple of slides on uh, ventricular assist device. Um, and I have a mix of some uh, guideline slides and uh, some evidence behind why the guidelines say we should use these drugs. Uh, so the goals of therapy in stable heart failure is clinical improvement. If you know, they're decompensated to some extent, stabilization so that they don't get worse, uh, reduction in morbidity, and the most important is reduction in mor mortality. Uh, these are the components of therapy, uh, assessment of the etiology, uh, correction of systemic factors, lifestyle modification, avoidance of certain drugs, which can make heart failure worse. Uh, then pharmacological therapy, influenza and pneumococcal va vaccination, and then mechanical therapy, which would include devices like ICD, CRT, and uh, ventricular assist device, and eventually heart uh, transplantation. Um, so ac accurate assessment of etiology is important. We all you know, do a good history, physical, ECG, chest x-ray, echocardiograph. Uh, I, I usually get blood count, electrolytes, uh, ion studies. This is important because I had a girl well, six months ago, 25-year-old, uh, actually of Pakistani origin, and had EF of 5 percent, a very small lady, and uh, actually after all the workup, we found that uh, she had hemochromatosis uh, and used ion chelating agent, and her EF improved, uh, normalized uh, within one year. And then ischemia workup if patients fall in that category. Uh, so the guidelines do recommend, this is class 1A, you have to measure uh, 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 EF, and obviously as cardiologists we would do it by echocardiogram, uh, but MAGA is also an option. Um, how you correct the systemic factors, so ischemia, if there is ischemia, you got to uh, treat the ischemia, uncontrolled hypertension, valvular disease, uh, other factors like infection, diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, and patient-related factors if uh, they have a history of heavy alcohol use, uh, dietary non-compliance, especially very high salt intake uh, that needs to be done. Smoking cessation, alcohol, salt to two or three grams a day total. Weight reduction up to 20% of ideal body weight. And daily weight monitoring. I think a lot of studies have shown that daily weight monitoring is the best way to prevent rehospitalization in patients. And uh, at least I recommend my patients to weigh themselves every day. And if their weight goes up over two pounds, which would be one kilo, uh, usually I ask them to take an extra dose of diuretic, whatever they are on. Uh, these are the drugs to be avoided in patients with uh, heart failure, NSAIDs, antiarrhythmics, PDE3 inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and this oral hypoglycemic agents. So the, I think it's cut off here, but the guidelines, that's a class one indication here that these drugs are known to affect the clinical status of patients and should be avoided or withdrawn if the patients are uh, on these medications, obviously if it's possible. Um, pharmacological therapy, loop diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs on patients who can take ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, once the patient is stable on ACE inhibitor, aldestrone antagonist, and this combination of hydralazine nitrate, important in U.S. for African-American population, and uh, digoxin. 
Uh, again, diuretic uh, indication is class 1. Diuretic and salt restrictions are indicated in all patients with prior symptoms of heart failure who have evidence of fluid retention. So sometimes patients, if their blood pressure is borderline and you want to maximize their ACE inhibitor and beta blocker and they, are not, they don't have any evidence of volume overload, um, they can get away with being off diuretics. How about the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers? I mean, these are the two strongest medications which most patients, not all, most, but all patients absolutely need to be on. Uh, ACE inhibitors are recommended. This is class 1A. Uh, uh, and use of one of these three beta blockers. So it's, it has to be bisoprolol, carbidolol, or sustained release metoprolol. So it has to be the long-acting uh, metoprolol, not a BID dose. ACE inhibitor, all this started with the SAVE trial where more than 2,000 patients who were three days post-MI and uh, they had EF of less than 40% were randomized to captopril or placebo and followed over three and a half years and there was 19% reduction in all-cause mortality in patients who take captopril and 22% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. This is uh, from meta-analysis of five different trials, patients who take took ACE inhibitors versus patients who uh, did not get ACE inhibitor, uh, the mortality is higher in patients who got ACE inhibitors. And this goes all the way up to five years. Uh, this is the one for beta blocker from Merit Heart Failure Trial. Uh, here, metoprolol XL was used. Again, the cumulative mortality is lower in patients who got long-acting metoprolol versus who got placebo. Uh, so it also reduces the number of uh, uh, heart failure requiring hospitalization. So besides mortality, <coughs> it also reduces the rehospitalization rate. Carvedilol uh, evidence is from Copernicus, uh, Carvedilol BID, and these are patients with class four heart failure and uh, low EF. Their their risk of death was reduced by 38 percent compared to uh, patients who got placebo. So this is uh, basically this shows that all across patient population, male, female, you know, diagnosis of heart failure more than five years, less than five years, low EF, slightly higher EF, ischemic, non-ischemic, uh, they all benefited from carvedilol BID. <coughs> in fact, in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, higher dose of carvedilol leads to higher increase in ejection fraction. So. That, 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 that benefit is slightly less in ischemic, but in non-ischemic, definitely you want to maximize to 25 milligram BID of carvedilol. So is one of, ACE or beta blocker is one of the two enough, and again, that's not correct. You have to have both of them, and this, this one shows the additive benefit. This is the benefit of ACE inhibitor only. This is beta blocker only. This is the combined effect of ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Uh, this is again in another format, but patients who got beta blocker and enalapril, uh, they did much better. And these are actually asymptomatic LV dysfunction patients than patients who got neither enalapril or beta blocker only. So the guidelines, again, just to uh, reinforce, ACE inhibitor beta blockers are must, and uh, ideally it has to be one of these three beta blockers to be used. Uh, ARBs, uh, they are obviously used in patients who cannot take ACE inhibitors for any reason. Uh, dig uh, digoxin, all the evidence of digoxin comes from the DIGS trial, DIG trial, and uh, I put all my patients on digoxin if they have low EF. Uh, and it has not shown to improve mortality, actually total mortality at four years, actually all throughout. There is no difference between digoxin and placebo, but it does reduce uh, rehospitalization and worsening of heart failure. Uh, in fact, the patients who were on digoxin and some of them were taken off digoxin and put on placebo, if you look over uh, 80 months, uh, patients with, uh, plus on placebo had worsening of heart failure versus patients who continued on digoxin. Uh, an important thing in digoxin is the DIG level. <coughs> All the benefits are seen in patients whose DIG level was between 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. So you want to make sure it doesn't go over 0.8. Uh, how about the uh, aldosterone antagonist? Uh, we talked about it, this yesterday in some other talk, but uh, they are indicated. That comes from RAILS trial. Uh, 
but uh, you cannot use it if patient's creatinine is more than 2.5 in men, more than 2.0 in women, or if their potassium level is more than 5. This is from the RAILS trial. Patients who got aldactone over three years, their survival was higher versus patients who were on placebo. Um, hydralazine and nitrate, I, as I mentioned, it's recommended in patients who are African Americans. Uh, but you can also use this in you know other population, but that's a class 2A recommendation, not class 1. Aspirin, there is no recommendation in guidelines uh, about heart failure, but use of aspirin uh, does reduce mortality uh, to some extent. And I think we all use uh, aspirin in patients who have heart failure, even if they don't have coronary artery disease. Uh, device therapy, I'm sure it has been covered in uh, EP lectures, <coughs> but ICD are indicated for primary and secondary prevention of sudden cardiac death, and CRT in patients with class 2 or 3, uh, heart failure, EF of less than 30, 35 percent, but that QRS has to be more than 120 millisecond. Um, so this is for primary prevention. Um, you know, the guidelines are very strict about you have to wait 40 days post-MI and make sure that EF is still low before you can uh, put an ICD. And I'm sure a lot of this is related to the cost of ICDs and CRTs. They're extremely expensive uh, procedures. Uh, for secondary prevention, anyone who had cardiac arrest, VFib, or hemodynamically destabilizing ventricular tachycardia, they should get an ICD. CRT, uh, again, in patients with EF of less than 35%, uh, they have to be symptomatic, and they have to have QRS more than 120 millisecond. That's class one indication uh, to get a CRT. Uh, this is the same. So how about the refractory end-stage heart failure patients? You have to identify and try to uh, re control the fluid retention as much as we can. And then uh, eventually we refer to the cardiac transplant center. In Dallas, we have two of them. One is in the UT Southwestern. The other one is at the Baylor Hospital, which is run by my own group. Uh, and uh, so those are class one indications to refer them to transplant patients if patients are not improving. Uh, hospitalized patient, you uh, intensify the diuretic treatment by either using higher dose of loop diuretic or add a, another diuretic or uh, use a continuous IV infusion of loop diuretic. Although there is one study which showed continuous IV Lasix uh, was not any significantly different than uh, BID or Q8 hour dose of IV Lasix. Ventricular assist device, uh, this has been coming up uh, quite a bit in, uh, in U.S. Uh, as what we call uh, not, a, not a bridge to transplant, but a destination therapy. Uh, in fact, within the last six months, two of my patients have been able to get uh, HeartMate 2. Uh, one was young, 20-year-old, and the other one was 68, and they both had uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy from uh, treatment for leukemia. Uh, so obviously they're not a transplant candidate till they are cancer free for, I don't know what the guidelines said, three or five years. So they got a ventricular assist device and doing extremely well. Um, the indications are in patients whose systolic blood pressure is less than 80 and cardiac index is less than two liters per minute per meter square. Uh, and they ideally have to be a transplant candidate and they have to be on maximal inotropic support so if my patients are on home on IV dobutamine and IV Primacore, I mean, that's the time they, I really call the transplant people and say, you really need to move this patient up and do it quickly and not just put them on a waiting list. So ventricular assist device initially started as a bridge to transplant. Uh, so while patients are waiting for transplant and they had non-reversible heart failure, which you can't do anything about, and they have imminent risk of death. Now it's used more as a destination therapy, and this is for NYHA class 3B and class 4 heart failure who have been on optimal medical therapy for at least 45 of the last 60 days. And if they are not a candidate for transplant right away, just like my two leukemia patients were. Uh, so, so they get, and the, the, the evidence of a ventricular assist device has been going on for quite some time. This is an old rematch from 2003 where patients with end-stage heart failure, 
the one on the top, they are the ones who got uh, ventricular assist device uh, at uh, this is 30 days a day. There was uh, the patients who didn't get it, they, they had only 8% survival versus patients who got ventricular assist device, they had 29%. Now it's much better than that. Uh, the subject given was uh, burden of ILD in India prevention and future. Now we all know that incidence of and prevalence of ischemic heart disease is, is in India is increasing tremendously. Perhaps it is the effect of globalization and urbanization with rural to urban migration and this has resulted in lifestyle transition nutritional and socio-economic transitions. Now root causes are environmental, behavioral and societal and added to that is aggressive marketing of unhealthy products especially in the last 20 years and there is a dramatic shift in diet and living behavior in individuals, families and communities. We all know that at least in Mumbai I find that most of the middle class families have at least two lunches or dinners per week in the malls. Now what are the socio-economic determinants of this? Now the affluent class has high incidence of childhood and adult obesity. This is mostly related to unhealthy diet, consumption of processed food with high content of trans fatty acids and salts, consumption of aerated beverages, and the lack of physical activity, I know most of the children today play football on the flat screen. Childhood obesity and abdominal obesity, which is a metabolic syndrome, is becoming a major risk factor for early onset of adult cardiovascular disease and diabetes, as well as insulin resistance. Whereas the problems of low social economic status, we all know both in urban and rural areas, tobacco use both in smoking form and smokeless form is rampant. Uh, the smokeless tobacco, especially chewing, is very extensive. We have no idea how many, in, including women, I mean in the rural areas and urban areas, low socioeconomic group, women chew tobacco as much as men do. This has resulted in overcrowding, especially due to migration. As you know, people have to live in the hutment areas. This has led to social psychosocial problems, pollutions, and infections. And we know today inflammation and infection is a cause of increased evidence of atherosclerosis. Now, low socioeconomic group also needs to maternal malnutrition. Neonates with low birth weight has higher incidence of re insulin resistance in adult life. Now, what is the problem once you are belong to that social economic group? This is a group that is less likely to have diagnosed diabetes mellitus and hypertension as against people of middle class and higher, middle cla higher class because they go for frequent uh, 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 examinations. Tobacco use, I've already said. They present more with ST elevation MI and they're less likely to undergo percutaneous procedures or bypass surgeries, and also less like to continue long-term medication for secondary prevention, because taking beta blockers, statins, aspirin is the only cheapest drug. So that also they discontinue very quickly. So social and economic status is impacting India or developing countries. Now I'm not going through the risk factor, because they are very well known. The only really a risk factor now today we should talk in India is metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and psychosocial factors. Now this is a WHO risk prediction chart and these are patients with diabetes and you'll find that on top there are men and women classified smokers and non scopers On the right hand side there is a systolic blood pressure, age and lower down it's a cholesterol. And if you find that if you are Older the age, higher the blood pressure, more the cholesterol, and if you're a smoker, especially amongst women, you'll find that smoking women have much more incidence of, uh, more than 40% incidence, whereas the younger the age, it becomes better. 
Now, the new cardiovascular, I'm skipping this slide because I don't have time, but genetic polymorphism, endothelial markers, C-reactive proteins, etc., need to be studied more in detail. Now, the other risk equivalents or factors are, yesterday someone has spoken about carotid intima, medical, uh, medial thickness, ankle brachial index, which usually indicates peripheral vascular disease, and currently erectile dysfunction as well as is considered as subclinical evidence of atherosclerosis. Coronary calcium score, yesterday someone has given you limitations of doing it and interpreting the procedure. However, if you have a high coronary uh, calcium score, it is intimately associated with total plaque burden and it is a strong predictor of cardiovascular events. Essentially, it is independent of traditional risk factor or risk scores. Now, it differentiates between, of course, uh, non-coronary events like cardiomyopathy. It can diagnose additionally MI or LVH and may influence therapeutic decisions. However, I'm not suggesting that everyone undergoes uh, CT scan, only intermediate, high intermediate uh, group should undergo. Now, a lot has been talked about framing of score. This is from a framing study. The original score came in 1998 and it was modified in 2003. And that modification was that they did not include diabetes mellitus as a risk factor because it was accepted as coronary risk equivalent. And what they studied was age, total cholesterol, high HDL cholesterol, tobacco use, and systolic blood pressure. So to my mind, there are some limitations here. I'm skipping this because how exactly it is calculated. But those with low risk are less than 10 percent, intermediate group is 10 to 20 percent, and high risk group is 20 percent or above. And this gives you a 10 year old, 10 year cardiovascular mortality. Now the limitations of this score is that it was validated only in European Americans and African Americans. They were not validated in Native Americans, Hispanics, especially South Asians, Indian, uh, large number of Indians there. It predicts only the acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarctions, and chronic coronary artery disease. However, it does not tell you anything about congestive heart failure or atrial fibrillation. Now, in this score, LDL cholesterol as well as triglycerides were not included, nor was included diabetes mellitus, obesity, smokeless tobacco use, etc., which is very common in our country. And it inadequately predicts risk in cardiac patients in young because AMI has a higher first time AMI in young because age gets a lot of uh, weightage in this score. So in a younger person, it is not of much use. Uh, now there are certain other European and UK scores, they also have their own limitations and I'm not going in detail. Now this is a study, unfortunately, we in India do not have our own epidemiological data at all. There are no controlled randomized trial and this is from 1990 to 2007. Uh, look at the picture. It's only in South India and parts of the North India that some studies have been done. There have been crude prevalence. It, this article particularly states it in urban end. And so most of the part of the country, we have had no studies. So we do not have our own data to go by. And that's, uh, that's important because Public Health Institute is coming up now and taking part in a good number of international trials where India will be covered. Now, interheart study uh, gives us something. It was held in 2000 uh, for risk factors of AMI and coronary artery disease among Indians. It gives adjusted odds ratios and population adjusted risk of AMI among Indians. And it considers not only risk factors, but it also is co considers favorable factors. Now, I've chosen this because it just tells you roughly again methodology is not very really good, but it has included favorable factors like healthy diet and uh, physical activity. And this is the ratio you find that if all the risk factors are there, 
then the incidence goes very high. However, the limitations is favorable and unfavorable or risk factors combination study has not been done. And this is, tells you the odds ratio almost going to more than 300% in this study. This is, now what happens with, I've chosen these small studies really because at least the follow-up is reasonably good. Now this, this is an escort study about uh, what happens with interventions. Uh, in India, what's happening? Again, their own data, we really still do not have uh, accumulated uh, country data. From 1988 to 2005, PCI increased between five to 10 times, CABG increased five times, and it is three times more surgery at that institute compared to valvular and congenital heart diseases. Of course, there's a limitation because valvular heart disease incidence uh, in private hospitals perhaps is much lower than in general hospitals. And because of um, diagnosis of congenital heart disease uh, by fetal echo, uh, the incidence of congenital heart disease may be going down. Now, World Bank Disease Control Priority Project tells us that there is increased incidence of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and low and middle income countries. This is extremely important because there, is, there was a feeling that uh, this disease is common amongst the rich and the developed countries. It's not so. Between 1990 and 2010, they tell us that it is anticipated to increase by 120% in women and 130% in men in developing countries compared to 30 and 60% in developed countries. Now, Public Health Institute uh, with Goenka, Prabhakaran, and Dr. Reddy also is a co-author of this. They have stated that prevalence of coronary vascular, cardiovascular disease has increased by over the last 30 years. It has doubled. In 2005, 30% 90%, of all deaths were due to cardiovascular disease. It is estimated by 2020, this will be a number one cause of death and disability in India. More the Indians are succumbing to diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension than any other country. It occurs five to 10 years earlier in Indians than in their counterparts in developed world. And the prevalence in women, including premenopausal women, is increasing. The dominant victims of coronary vascular disease and its risk factors are socially, economically disadvantaged sections. And that's the larger part of our country because we know about 60% of our people live below poverty line. And WHO data says, tells us that India has lost $9 million in national income in 2005 due to premature death due to cardiovascular disease and it is likely to lose $237 billion by 2015. And this, is, this just gives you a rough graph that how even a younger age group now is suffering more compared to older age group. Compared to other countries, you, this is age standardized death between 30 and 70 years per 100,000. UK it is 180, China, 280 and India is 405. We are almost more than double than UK. It is related that below 70 years, 50% in India compared to 22 in Western countries. And it is expected that by 2020, 60% of world's heart disease will be in India. Now global burden again, you'll see that by 2020, we are going to have 2.58 mil deaths per million compared to China, which is in fact improving in their uh, cardiovascular health. Mortality, global mortality is 12.12. .12. Indian cardiovascular mortality is 14%. Age standardized deaths per 100,000, 138 versus 207. And disability adjusted life years are 2.0 crores globally, out of which 1.5 crore will be in India, a real large burden. So in conclusion, IHD prevalence in India is increasing due to unhealthy lifestyle and psychosocial stress. IHD in India is, occurs at earlier age. It is multivessel and diffuse. It is increasing in women. Unless drastic measures are taken early in life, burden is likely to increase by 130, by 220, 
An increased burden of IHD threatens to cripple Indian workforce and stunt our economic growth. And this is what we're going to have in the afternoon, and burden is going to increase further. Thank you very much. I am going to go minimally invasive cardiac surgery and hybrid cardiac surgery. As a routine, we always start with the history, and we all know that cardiac surgery is not even a century old, and the first <coughs> surgery on the heart was done probably in 19, uh, 1896, and after that, there has been a revolution in the treatment of heart surgeries, uh, of the heart problems, initially with uh, CMCs and then uh, CABGs and re replacement and then repairs and everything. And ultimately, after the advent of uh, heart-lung machine in 1953, the ch uh, scenario of cardiac surgery changed dramatically. And now you can say, you name the uh, disease, you name the problem of heart, it can be treated uh, by a surgical method. But till date, the traditional approach has always been a sternotomy. This has been always a safe approach, easy approach, and a very a uh, comfortable approach for a cardiac surgeon, but definitely it has its own disadvantages. A big scar is there, a bone is cut, so recovery period is uh, slow. And along with that, because there is a big scar, there are problems of uh, scar-related issues like pain, and neurological pain, healing problem, because most of these patients are diabetic patients. So, India has not changed, but definitely cardiac surgery has changed and as a laparoscopic surgery has become a gold standard gradually a minimally invasive cardiac surgery is gaining momentum and is becoming a start a, a form of a standard form of treatment in lot of ailments in heart problems so what is uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery it is a cardiac surgery performed through a small incision wherein incision instead of 8 to 12 inches it is uh, small to three to four inches using specialized instruments, using specialized uh, machineries and using specialized heart lung machine equipments. This surgery is done and these are the different approaches to the heart. You can see it can be partial sternotomy, only part of the manubrium is cut or lower part of the sternum is cut or you can go through between the ribs that is a thoracotomy approach. So this is the obvious uh, difference you can see. This is the traditional conventional approach and this is the minimally invasive approach. And I think you can appreciate that this is the minimum trauma that you can give to the patient with the maximum benefit to the patient. So what all the procedures can be done in a minimally invasive cardiac surgery? There is a list of uh, procedures, mitral valve repair, replacement, ESG closure, VSG closure, RA, LA, myxoma. Selected cases of uh, CABG, not all CABGs, AVR and multivalvular lesion, particularly only it is a mitral or a tricuspid lesion is there. Uh, mitral and aortic cannot be combined, but mitral and tricuspid can be combined. So what are the advantages of mix? Yeah, it is a uh, lot of advantages are there. First and foremost is faster recovery patient is better in a period of a few days patient becomes absolutely normal second thing ICU stay is small probably uh, two days or at the most uh, three days and patient is discharged from the hospital in another five days pain level because the incision site is small you, uh, you don't cut the bones in most of the cases because it is a, uh, in between the two ribs so the pain level is less rehabilitation is faster Mobility is faster. Patient can be get mobilized within probably 24 hours. Important thing is he is back to his normal routine in a, a period of one month. And this is very important in a people like an electrician or daily wager who is running his house on daily wages. If you ask that person to stay at home, don't go for work for three months after a routine conventional surgery, then it is very difficult to sustain that family. So definitely it is useful in this sort of patients. I have a patient who was an electrician. One patient was in uh, Senai Vagade Chae. They were back to work in a period of one, one and a half month. And they were very happy. 
कि इन स्पेड ऑफ ए बिग सर्जरी दे आर बैक टू वर्क सो अर्ली एंड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इन फीमेल्स मैरिड और अनमेरिड यंग फीमेल पेशेंट एंड यंग मेल पेशेंट गेटिंग ए मिड लाइन स्कार इज ऑलवेज ट्रॉमा टू देर सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस दे डेवलप इंफ्योरिटी कॉम्प्लेक्स इन दम सेल्स सो इन दिस सॉर्ट ऑफ कैटेगरी ऑफ पेशेंट इट इज अ रियल बूम एंड दे कैन रियली गेट मैक्सिमम एडवांटेज ऑफ दिस सर्जरी एंड कैन रियली लिव अ नॉर्मल लाइफ सो दिस इज एग्जाम्पल ऑफ अ पेशेंट दैट वी ऑपरेटेड इफ यू सी दिस पेशेंट नो स्कार इज सीन इफ यू जस्ट लिव द ब्रेस्ट सब मेमोरी इंसिजन इज सीन एंड ए एस डी क्लोजर वॉज डन इन दिस पेशेंट सिमिलरली इफ यू सी दिस पेशेंट इफ अ कन्वेंशनल माइट्रोल वॉल रिप्लेसमेंट और रिपेयर वॉज डन दिस वुड बी द इंसिजन लेंथ बट इन दिस पेशेंट इट इज हार्डली सीन बिकॉज ऑफ द पेंडुलस ब्रेस्ट बट यू देर इज नो स्कार इन द सेंटर रिसेंटली आई डिड वन डॉक्टर फ्रॉम राजकोट डॉक्टर गांधी दे वे वेरी एप्रीहेंसिव दे नेवर न्यू दैट दिस सॉर्ट ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट इज अवेलेबल and you won't believe in 20 days they were back to oman and she was so happy ki i am really relieved because of this uh, surgery he, she got a um, uh, mitral valve replacement this is a cabg conventional form and if you see this is the minimally invasive form here you can see a small scar in the left thoracotomy so this is now becoming a, a standard form of treatment there are tons and loads of uh, literature available everywhere and everybody has agreed to that ke definitely in selected few cases this is a good form of treatment so this was in uh, innovations and uh, technological advancement in minimally invasive cardiac surgery but parallel to this if you see the catheter based treatment was also growing at a very fast pace the first catheter introduced uh, was introduced in 1929 by a uh, foster man who introduced a foley's catheter into the cephalic vein and entered into the right atrium and that really changed the uh, perspective of people and then in 1953 seldinger came up with this technique of catheter introduction and that really revolutionized the treatment of catheter based treatment and after that it has gone leaps and bounds <clears throat> and then in 1958 sons did an accidental angiography which lead led to a treatment form of uh, angioplasty also and hence in last 15 to 20 years catheter based treatment is being done in coronary arteries carotid arteries renal arteries angioplasties are done asd pda closures arrhythmia ablations balloon atrial mitral and pulmonary valvotomy are being done on a very routine base so two technologies they are growing at a very fast rate and taking the inspiration from this proverb people thought of let us this two speciality come together and really give an advantage to the patient and as you know yesterday cure by told about i cloud computing same thing we also are applying this in this field of cardiology and cardiac surgery we are trying to bring two specialties who can give the best care to the patient utilizing multiple technologies as possible and important thing is realization that two technologies are not competitive but they are complementary to each other and then that can give an advantage to the patient and important thing is initially the cardiologist or cardiac surgeons were the main people they were like an iconic uh, uh, figure but now the approach is changing now it is becoming a, pa a patient centric approach so patient is now in the center and rest everybody is around so that has changed the perspective and hence the best outcome is to be thought of for the patient in a high risk category patients and because right now patient doesn't care who treats them they just want the best treatment in the best possible way so this led to a fusion interventional cardiologists with percutaneous catheter based treatment and cardiac surgeons with open heart surgery Uh, speciality and uh, uh, authority 
They fused and uh, formed a cardiovascular disease specialty, which now are a team which are doing TEB procedure, that is transcatheter endovascular beating heart procedure. So this is what is a hybrid surgery, wherein the good things of cardiac surgery and good things of uh, catheter-based treatment are mixed together and the best treatment is given to the patient. Ultimate aim is to reduce the morbidity and mortality of the patient in a very high risk category of patient. Very important to think is hybrid therapy is a state of mind, not a rigidly defined state of procedure. So it is in the mind, we have to think, we have to tailor make the uh, treatment. So when should the hybrid procedure be given to the patient? When any one form of treatment cannot give a safe alternative, safe treatment, safe long-term outcomes in that patient. For example, if a patient is having a CT of LAD artery and a discrete lesion in a circumflex artery, then just doing a circumflex angioplasty is not going to benefit. Plus, the patient is a high-risk category because he is on a steroid therapy, very obese patient, and having multiple comorbid condition. Then, in that sort of patients, you can combine two treatment: do a lima to LAD, because LAD is chronically blocked, and do an angioplasty to that artery. So, overall benefit to the patient is seen in hybrid procedure, and this is applied in this category of patients. There is coronary revascularization, aortic valve replacement, congenital heart disease, aortic aneurysm, and mitral valve therapy. But very important to understand right now, it is offered only in high-risk category patients, not in a low-risk category patients. So how the uh, uh, coronary revascularization is based, it is based on three, four facts. One thing is there is no alternative to Lima to LAD. It is the golden graft, which practically never get blocks. And important uh, other thing is in triple vessel disease or double vessel disease with high syntax score, PCI has no advantage over CABG, and even uh, medical therapy is better in that uh, category of patients. But at the same time, angioplasty to circumflex and right arteries, the patency rate with the uh, drug eluting stent is less than 10% right now in this era. Taking that advantage, few selected patients can be offered a hybrid surgery in coronary uh, revascularization like left main coronary artery disease, pure left main. There is no other lesion anywhere. You do a Lima to LAD graft, and you put a stent from left main to circumflex artery, and patient gets the maximum benefit of this. And, but very important thing, that patient should be having comorbid conditions like advanced age, long steroid use, need for another major operative procedure probably in near future, and patients with arthritic and orthopedic problems, rheumatoid arthritis is one of the example. This is one example that we did, had a osteal LED lesion with a circumflex OM lesion there. So first what we did is we did a Lima to LED graft. And then on third post-operative day, uh, angioplasty was done on the uh, right circumflex artery. Circumflex artery. These are the results available everywhere uh, showing the data of uh, minimally invasive uh, hybrid surgery. Similarly, Tavi, yesterday probably Milan Bhai has spoken in length. I'm not going to go into detail. So this is again an emerging branch in high risk old age group with severe aortic stenosis. And this is a good classic example for hybrid. This female patient, grossly obese, 85 year old, having rheumatoid arthritis on chronic steroid therapy, had underwent CABG and mitral valve repair, has developed again a mitral regurgitation so that patient was taken for hybrid wherein from transapical region, you can see the video, transapically into that ring, a uh, sapien valve was introduced and that patient was fine and was discharged in third day. This is recently I saw at Leipzig when I went to uh, a conference. So this is wall in wall. There are planned surgeries, sometimes hybrid, and there are sometimes unplanned because of emergencies, patients come up with acute coronary syndrome, you do angioplasty, patient has a other left main disease or has a valvular problem, you treat it in another three to four days. 
Same thing can be applied in atrial fibrillation. Ajay Bhai knows it. It is difficult sometimes to treat uh, atrial fibrillation because coronary, uh, this uh, pulmonary veins are inaccessible sometimes. In that category of patient, combination of epicardial atrial fibrillation through minimally invasive and percutaneous approach for endocardial ablation is done. In congenital heart disease, with high risk category pediatric patients with multiple VSDs, severe pH, unstable infants and neonate patients. Here, recently we did two cases, uh, just two days back, wherein there were three VSDs. One VSD was closed uh, uh, surgically and two muscular and apical VSD were closed by uh, this uh, uh, approach. This is, and uh, last but not the least, in thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm. It is a devastating disease. You have to do uh, reimplantation of vessels and everything. In that case also, mixture of endovascular stent and branching vessel uh, revascularization is done and that gives a maximum advantage to the patient with minimal mortality. These are the few uh, literatures. And in conclusion, minimally invasive cardiac surgery is the known standard form of treatment in many cardiac condition. The future of cardiac surgery and intervention cardiology is headed towards a merger of the field tailored approach to the patient who is uh, present with a complex and high risk category patient. But ultimately, this can be extended to a normal patients also, provided that technology advances, improved percutaneous and minimally invasive techniques are uh, uh, innovated, and availability of the hybrid suit. So at the end, I would say, hybrid is basically a mixture of, aggression of uh, aggressiveness of a surgeon and gentleness and tenderness of a cardiologist that ultimately gives the best result to the patient. This is our experience. We have done almost 90 cases, highest in Western India. These are the few patient figures. And this is the surprise awaiting for all cardiac patients. And probably a smile will be there on all patients. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see that uh, we've got more people coming in as the day goes on. I'm going to talk a little bit about acute heart failure uh, management, present and future. Um, there's a lot of good news here. There's also some equally um, uh, depressing news uh, with heart failure. I'm just going to start off with a clinical case study. Um, I'm sure that many of the cardiologists and I think also many of the internists have probably seen in their practice, but um, we'll just walk through this and, and um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the management issues uh, in a patient such as this. So we've got a 70-year-old man who presents with acute shortness of breath. He denies any ischemic chest pain. His prior medical history is significant for an MI about five years ago and had a bypass about three years ago. He's got a chronically depressed EF of 15%. He's been hospitalized twice now in the past six months with acute decompensated heart failure. And when he arrives uh, to the hospital, uh, his blood pressure is 100 over 50. He's tachycardic but regular at 110. He's breathing a little bit labored with a respiratory rate of 22. He's afebrile. He's got an elevated JVP that you can see almost to his ears. Uh, he has riles uh, and crackles one-third of the way up in his back. He has an S3 gallop. He's got a hepatojugular ref um, uh, reflux, and he's got two-plus pitting edema, which he said has been getting worse over the last seven to ten days. So, you know, b back when I was born, which was uh, 1974, you know, the state-of-the-art therapy uh, for acute decompensated heart failure was diuretics, vasodilators, oxygen, and at that time you could consider inotropic therapy. Uh, I think the bad news is, is that that therapy has not changed 37 years later with the uh, predominant um, use of diuretic therapy um, for acute uh, heart failure. You can see here um, the use of some other medications, primarily inotropes, nitroglycerin, um, and niceratide um, used prior to this, send HF um, study here in the U.S. So with that, how are we uh, treating these sort of patients uh, and what's the latest evidence in 2012? Well, just, just briefly to, to review, um, you know, uh, chronic and acute uh, diastolic heart failure is a neurohormonal response with basically alterations in LV uh, remodeling uh, that has a basically a negative effect on the uh, cardiac output, the cardiac function, the uh, function of the myocardium. And this is primarily uh, the result of um, 
activation of your renin angiotensin testing system um, and others that promote uh, myocardial toxicity, uh, ischemia, peripheral vasoconstriction, causing hemodynamic alterations, and hence um, uh, retention of fluid that's abnormal and third spacing of that fluid to give you the symptoms of um, uh, heart failure, particularly uh, lower extremity edema, rails, and so forth. So uh, our current therapies really fall into three categories. One is to reduce the fluid volume with diuretics. Uh, the other is to decrease the preload uh, and or the afterload using vasodilative therapy. And then really augment contractility and improve um, cardiac output with the use of inotropes. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about ultrafiltration today. I'm not going to talk too much about um, a continuous positive pressure ventilation, um, but uh, you know, those are temporizing um, uh, technologies for your acute decompensated heart failure patients that come in, um, at least in the short term, while you uh, use other therapies to uh, improve their cardiac function and um, their, improve their uh, diuresis. Um, there's some good news and bad news here for 30-day mortality for heart failure that really has not been much change over the past 60 years. Um, One-year mortality, particularly um, in women, has not changed. We've seen a little bit of improvement um, in men, and the bad news is five-year mortality in this population is still 50 percent. So, um, you know, unfortunately, even with the therapies we have today, and we've had for now 30 or 40 years, um, we've made some improvements, but there's significant opportunities to improve the care of these patients. Why have we struggled with treating acute decompensated heart failure? Well, um, it's a complex uh, problem. It's got uh, multiple features, multiple systems involved, multiple factors in play. And we don't have great surrogate uh, to help us guide um, therapy and that also help us predict long-term outcomes. Uh, we have continued concern about new therapies in particular, but a lot of the old therapies have a lot of toxicity, which we'll talk about. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this this time. I, uh, in the past, I have given some lectures on some of the more novel therapies, but um, uh, unfortunately, all of these have been uh, resounding failures, so I'm not going to spend too much time on those. So uh, Millen, by spent a little bit of time talking about diuretics and uh, some recent studies about that, I'm not going to spend too much time on that other than to say that diuretic therapies is a double-edged sword. So we know that they help pr uh, promote um, natiuresis, diuresis, uh, but heart failure and uh, chronic kidney disease, which we see a lot of in these populations, really limits the potency of uh, loop diuretic therapy. And um, we also see this phenomenon that's been well studied that um, you get subsequent uh, decrease in effects the longer you use um, Lasix and um, you get uh, long-term tolerance due to tubular hypertrophy as a compensatory mechanism. And, and this is just another uh, graphic showing that over time, um, within you know, eight hours, you see significantly lower GFR in patients that receive uh, Lasix. So, uh, once again, it does help promote some of that fluid loss, but it does come at a cost. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but here's just some common starting doses for patients with various um, uh, renal function uh, with uh, various loop diuretics. And you can see the IV loading dose and then the subsequent doses. We know from um, the, the um, 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 dose trial uh, of using Lasix that uh, there is some uh, better uh, advantages to using continuous infusions as opposed to um, the bolus doses, uh, but I think there's still a role, um, at least in acute decompensant heart failure, to continue to use boluses in very select cases. Um, we, besides the, the dose study, there's been uh, a lot of observational data looking at loop diuretics. There's been a lot of controversy about loop diuretics. Uh, the, the, the sense um, uh, that I'll provide you here is that it's still a large unknown. A lot of the observational uh, data that we have is uh, significantly confounded just by the patient selection, physician decision making, and so it's really hard to tease out exactly what's going on in the use of uh, diuretics. 
We do know that patients, though, um, become unresponsive to high doses of diuretic drugs when they consume a large amount of dietary sodium, if they're taking um, NSAIDs, um, and as I mentioned before, have significant renal dysfunction. So I spend a lot of time with my patients counseling them when they start on diuretic therapy that um, it's critical that they monitor their salt intake. Uh, patients will sometimes think that they can continue to eat like they are because you've given them medicine, and, and really that just causes an ab um, uh, an adverse cascade of just uh, continue to have worsening heart failure, uh, continued refractoriness to um, loop diuretics, and, and a continued spiral down. I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about acute heart failure um, and inotropic therapy. Um, unfortunately, uh, the news here uh, is plus and minus, but just to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, where we find the best benefit for um, inotropic therapy is typically when um, patients have some congestion, um, uh, and we call them warm and wet, that means they've got uh, L, um, uh, fluid retention, yet they're perfusing uh, and have a decent cardiac output. Uh, you know, uh, for a while we thought there was a role for um, uh, niceratide. I think there's still a role here primarily in the uh, symptomatic patients, but without any benefit for short or long-term effects. Uh, cold and wet is uh, those patients who have uh, poor perfusion, poor cardiac output, as well as volume um, um, overload, uh, fluid retention. And this is where uh, vasodilator therapy particularly nitroglycerin, uh, can be uh, extremely helpful, and we'll talk briefly about that. Um, and then um, also in this situation, you can augment um, some of that diuresis and some of that improved cardiac output with inotropic uh, therapy, particularly with dobutamine, milrinone, um, and there's also a role for dopamine, certainly, in these situations. And then certainly in the cold and dry patients, these are patients who have chronically uh, low perfusion but don't have fluid retention. They're usually uvolemic, and, and once again, the role here is really for uh, chronic outpatient therapy but also um, uh, IV inotropic infusion. Um, and so just uh, some thoughts about inotropic therapy. You really should be targeting some physiologic parameters and uh, symptoms. Um, but you also need to re realize that particularly in cardiac patients, it does promote ischemia, which then can lead to um, uh, life-threatening arrhythmias. Um, and you should be sh sure to wean the support uh, slowly and over time and not uh, completely uh, turn off inotropic therapy or support in patients once you've started it. Um, and then you do have some concerns of patients developing tolerance over time, particularly in the case of dobutamine. I'm just going to skip uh, the slide in the interest of time. Um, once again, everything comes at a cost, and similar to the diuretic therapies, inotropic therapy um, are not benign therapies. I think that um, any of these therapies listed here, if uh, they were um, going to um, particularly milrinone and dobutamine, which is not on here, um, if uh, they were uh, up for the FDA uh, review and approval today, I can guarantee they probably would not be um, approved just given that uh, time and time again now with studies we've shown that there's increased morbidity and mortality um, versus placebo. But once again, we think that in, in unique situations and patients with uh, severe decompensated heart failure with uh, poor cardiac output that there's certainly a role to be played with the right balance of risk and benefit. I'm going to just talk uh, uh, briefly about uh, nitroglycerin. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of data, um, primarily, uh, you know, from 20 to 30 years ago, uh, of the beneficial role of um, IV nitrates. Uh, they significantly increase renin and aldosterone, particularly in patients with class 3 and class 4 heart failure, helping to promote some diuresis. Um, and, um, and this was uh, demonstrated with, you know, changes and uh, alterations in um, uh, parameters uh, such as uh, capillary uh, wedge pressures. Um, and it's really important to note that really the benefit is in IV nitroglycerin. There's not been any data to suggest that the transdermal uh, formulations do provide any benefit, particularly in um, acute decompensated heart failure. And so um, I know that uh, in our practice, the ER physicians will typically put on uh, transdermal um, uh, nitroglycerin, but that's of uh, limited benefit, particularly in acute decompensated heart failure. 
Uh, just to, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. Ultrafiltration, I don't know if this has made it to uh, India yet, but it's something that we're starting to use uh, more and more in selected patients. This is very similar to um, dialysis in terms of uh, being able to remove fluid but not altering the solute um, makeup of um, the patient's plasma or blood. And basically uh, what you're able to do is um, um, draw off fluid using ion ex uh, exchanges um, to, uh, to, to promote um, osmosis of fluid across a, a barrier. And, and usually these, are, these machines are quite tiny, as you can see here. Very, very small, fits on an, almost like an IV pole, um, and um, you know, typically require the placement of um, at least one pick line and another IV and uh, a very low uh, blow flow state through the machine. So you can adjust the parameters from anywhere to 10 mils uh, per minute to 40 mils per minute, um, and the, the system retains very little fluid volume, only about 33 uh, three, uh, milliliters. And uh, as I said, you can really um, to uh, dial in how much fluid you want to take off. And we've had a lot of success uh, taking off, you know, over the course of uh, 24 hours, six, seven liters of patients without really um, affecting their blood pressure, not affecting their electrolytes, um, and really seeing um, symptomatic improvement. We've actually noted that uh, patients with right-sided heart failure, for whatever reason, really respond to this better than patients who have primarily left-sided heart failure. Um, but basically, uh, there's been um, a couple of trials of this looking at uh, um, uh, ultrafiltration uh, compared to bolus um, loop diuretic therapy. The unload trial was the primary one that really showed that uh, there was significant weight loss at 48 hours in the uh, ultrafiltration arm um, compared to the standard of care arm with Lasix. There was no change in symptoms, though, which was a little bit surprising. You think with some uh, additional volume output, you would see some change in that. Uh, but um, once again, you see a net fluid loss also um, at 48 hours. So this is a really nice option um, for patients who may have low blood pressures, who, who may have you've maximized their diuretic therapy, and as I've said before, who primarily have right-sided heart failure. And here you can see just uh, some of the key endpoints also that were significant in this trial. Um, reduction in rehospitalization, rehospitalization. Uh, Spot, uh, rehospitalization um, uh, events, but no difference in mortality um, in these uh, patients. Here's just a slide to show you that uh, there's been a lot of interest in biomarkers. I have a talk tomorrow that will focus on BNP, but really there's been a lot of work in trying to um, uh, look at uh, a lot of these uh, markers, look at surrogate markers, with really um, what I'd say is limited success. Really the only two that have been significant um, in, in probably a decade, decade and a half of work, if not longer, have been BNP and creatinine in terms of uh, number one, uh, uh, being prognostic uh, to a certain extent, but number two, also helping to guide therapy, particularly in the case of BNP. Um, there's been, um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of disappointment in this field. I'm not going to go through these trials individually, but uh, initial excitement around some of these biomarkers, around um, some established agents that really have not panned out when you look at hard endpoints uh, in terms of acute decompensated heart failure. So, so unfortunately, the message here is we are still stuck in 1974 with a lot of the therapies um, that we can consider for these patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about device therapy. I think this is probably where we've made the most progress over the last 20 to 30 years, particularly with uh, biventricular pacing, uh, a huge number of trials over the past two, case, uh, two, two uh, decades, BIV, um, ICD therapy, um, just um, ICD therapy, and then left ventricular assist devices, um, both uh, percutaneous and uh, implantable. So uh, just to talk quickly about um, LVADs here, you can see um, a couple of different um, setups for um, these machines as well as um, the inpatient uh, uh, machines for these. So um, as you can see, these are uh, really unique continuous, in this case, the heart made two continuous flow devices. They're very, very tiny. You have uh, one um, port that's entered into the LV apex, another that um, is the outflow track into the aorta um, with a, a small little uh, 
uh, electrical cable to a portable battery that the patient carries around, and those batteries can last anywhere from 8 to 12 hours. So the patients need to be you know, sort of near backup uh, uh, batteries, but uh, very small implantable devices. And uh, one of the largest trials to date that was published a few years back in the New England Journal um, looked at uh, this technology in patients with uh, bridge stroke transplant and basically showed that there was um, significant improvement in survival uh, compared to um, standard therapy, uh, including um, um, uh, improvement in uh, long-term outcomes uh, with regards to death. Um, We've seen rapid improvement over the last probably five to uh, six years um, in this technology, uh, going from uh, pulsatile flow devices to continuous flow devices, which have uh, positively impacted survival in these patients. Um, and uh, more recent trials have actually looked at these therapies as destination therapies, showing significant benefit um, uh, in those uh, populations as well. So, you know, we expect that uh, more things will come out in terms of smaller devices, um, uh, uh, new technologies in terms of the battery packs, so that you don't have the lines that are coming out of the skin that are nidus for an infection and so on. Um, here in the last minute, just briefly, we're, there's also percutaneous support devices that have been used now primarily in the cath lab uh, for um, support for high-risk PCI, but we've started to use them also in heart failure patients um, as opposed to balloon pumps. So there's an impella device here that goes into the LV outflow track into the LV and is a device that uh, helps promote uh, cardiac output. Um, once again, it's uh, starting to gain um, some interest uh, and, uh, you know, can almost uh, do it uh, at the bedside if you've got bedside fluoro. There's also the tandem heart, uh, which is, um, um, requires both um, arterial and venous access uh, and a transeptal uh, puncture but uh, has also been successfully used in some of our high-risk PCI cases as well as decompensated heart failure patients to help bridge them temporarily. Um, so just to conclude here at the end of the time, you know, acute decompensated heart failure uh, is, uh, continues to be a, a big problem with significant morbidity and mortality. I'd like to say that we've made some progress over the last 60 years, but I think that's being optimistic. Um, once again, I think uh, in terms of pharmacotherapies, uh, it's been filled with more disappointments than excitement in terms of new therapies. The, uh, the most exciting areas are with device therapies uh, that I quickly went through, but also um, ultrafiltration may have a role. And uh, I didn't spend too much time on this, but you know, the mainstay of therapy that where we do have evidence um, are you know, the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, digoxin, and spirulinolactone. And so uh, appropriate use of those in appropriate populations um, has continued uh, to be beneficial. Uh, thank you very much.